Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be back here in Atlanta. As David has just said, this is the third exhibition I've been lucky enough to work on with the High Museum. And I have to say, since my last visit here in 2001 for the Degas Show, your museum has been absolutely transformed in the most spectacular way. So it's really wonderful to be associated with this fabulous new building and this great uh, collaboration that you have with the Louvre and to be a sort of small part of that. Um, I'm getting to know Atlanta quite well now. And at this time, I've actually been here for a whole week and the weather's so fabulous at the moment, I understand it's pouring with rain and gray and very cold in London. So I'm seriously considering relocating in the near future. <laughs> um, and I'm very pleased to have a chance to talk to you a bit about this, uh, what's been a fascinating exhibition for me to work on with uh, David Brenneman and our colleague in Denver, Timothy Standring. Um, because I think in a, a way it is a new look at Impressionism. I mean, obviously, Impressionism, as we all know, has become a very popular subject. It's been extensively written about and the subject of many, many exhibitions. But I think what we're doing here, which uh, in a nutshell is to try to uh, present the way the Impressionists learned from previous periods in the history of art and to sort of revise the popular notion that they just rejected everything that was to do with the past and created a, a brave new uh, modern art for the 19th century. But the story is rather more complex than that. Um, this has been the subject in various, uh, of a number of art historical studies, particularly ones devoted to uh, monographs on the on ind individual artists, uh, especially Manet, Cezanne, and Degas. But I, I don't think it's ever really been brought together comprehensively in an exhibition before. And I hope in this lecture today to sort of uh, elucidate for you some of the comparisons and confrontations that we've brought together and hope that that will enrich your enjoyment and understanding of the exhibition. So our first slide here is this very debonair figure who is the artist Edouard Manet, who lived from 1832 to 1883. Uh, he's absolutely pivotal to our story because he, perhaps more than any of the others, is the artist that really explored this paradox between both a respect for the art of the past, a tremendous capacity to learn from earlier art, and at the same time, a sort of rejection of it, a, kind of a rebellious streak in Manet, often done in a rather witty and humorous way. Strictly speaking, Manet is not really an impressionist in the narrowest definition, uh, meaning that he never exhibited at any of the six group, uh, group exhibitions that the impressionist group put on between 1874 and 1886. He was slightly older than most of them, but he, he was very much associated with them, a close friend of them all, and they looked up to him as a mentor and as, ex uh, and as an example. Well, um, Manet caused an absolute s sensation and a scandal in Paris with this painting, known as the Luncheon on the Grass, um, painted in 1863, now in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. Um, it was shown at an exhibition in 1863 called the Salon des Refusés, so-called because uh, these were people who, artists who were rejected from the huge official salon, which was held every year in Paris and included thousands of paintings. And it really was the only main way for a young artist or any artist to get his work exhibited and, therefore, and, and, and hopefully eventually sold. But in 1863, there were so many artists rejected from the salon that they set up a separate salon called the Salon des Refusés. And uh, it's difficult to recapture now um, what was so shocking about Impressionism. This is just before Impressionism and why uh, a, a, a public in Paris in 1863 should have been so scandalized by this painting. Well, one of the main reasons was the subject. Um, Manet has painted two contemporary young Parisian men. Um, apparently the one wearing a cap with a tassel might indicate that he was an art student with a naked female friend. 
And whereas it was fine to mix clothed men and naked women if you couched the subject of your painting in a historical guise, if it was gods and goddesses or some mythological or historic subject, it was very shocking to present them as very real contemporary Parisians. So perhaps it's rather surprising to learn that Manet actually explained to a friend that his intention in painting this picture was to do a modern version of this painting. Um, sorry. This painting, which is um, Titian's famous uh, Fête Champêtre in the Louvre. Uh, with this sort of Arcadian figures and the two uh, seated men and the naked women. Um, like all of the Impressionists, Manet spent a great deal of time in the Louvre and was very um, absorbed in the great masters of the Louvre. And this he set out is expressly, he described that this is what he wanted to do to make a modern Titian's Fête Champêtre. And I think that most of the audience at the Salon des Refusés in 1863 did not pick up this allusion. And neither did they pick up the other um, source, sorry, I haven't quite got the hang of this yet, uh, the other source for, um, for the Manet painting, which was a little more obscure. It's a print made by an Italian Renaissance printmaker called Marc Antonio Raimondi. And if we look at the three figures at the lower right here, uh, three river gods. It's actually based, the, this uh, whole composition was based on um, a lost cartoon um, of the Judgment of Paris by the great Italian Renaissance painter Raphael. But I think we can see in, in the poses of the three figures of the three river gods um, that Manet has based his very modern composition on this uh, Italian Renaissance print. Um, I want to just take this work, the Manet uh, Luncheon on the Grass, because it is so important for our story of sort of looking back and looking forward as a little bit of a case study. And if we fast forward um, about 100 years to 1960, we see Picasso making his version of Manet's uh, Luncheon on the Grass. Um, he did a whole series based on this particular painting. Here's another work. For th in this one, he's reduced the figures to these very uh, simple forms. And then in this version, uh, he's much more concerned with the whole sort of complexity of the composition. And then if we uh, look again around the same time, 1863, the exact centenary of Manet's painting, we find the French pop artist Alain Jacquet doing this. Um, again, updating it to the France of the 1960s. It has this funny texture because Jacquet was an artist who deliberately tried to imitate uh, mechanical um, reproduction processes, in this case, uh, sort of newspaper type. So I think I just showed you that little example to show you the power that a very major painting, the Titian and then the Manet and then Picasso and then this a pop artist, and I could show you several more examples of other more contemporary artists who have also been fascinated by the Manet painting to show how it can linger in the artistic memory and get recreated and reprocessed by each generation. Well, to go to the beginnings of Impressionism. Uh, this is the painting which really gave the movement its name. It's Monet's Impression Sunrise of 1874, which was one of the key works in the uh, Impressionist first group exhibition held in the studios of the photographer Nadar on the Boulevard des Capucines in Paris. Um, Many of the critics were puzzled by what the Impressionists were doing. To them, it seemed a provocative rejection of everything that they admired and revered about the art of the old masters, namely a very uh, polished technique, beautiful clear outlines, a smooth painterly surface which didn't show the brush brushstrokes, that artists who really had mastered the craft of painting. And what they found lamentably lacking in the Impressionists was this lack of skill and a lack of craft. Of course, I think most of us find this a wonderful impression of sunrise over the harbor at Le Havre, which is what the subject is. But Monet has painted it in the freest possible way, with just loose brushstrokes seemingly dotted randomly all over the canvas. He's not concerned with a realistic photographic 
um, mimicry of the subject. He is concerned with catching, capturing as, as immediately as possible the effects of light and atmosphere. And one of the critics said, oh, this is not really a painting, it's just an impression. And so hence the name um, Impression Sunrise, uh, which gave its name to the whole movement. So the Impressionists were breaking with past tradition in technique and also in subject matter. Um, this is Renoir's La Loge, the theater box, um, also of 1874, which was in that same first groundbreaking Impressionist exhibition. I think most of us would find this a very appealing and beautiful painting today. It is considered one of Renoir's great works. Um, has a sort of immediacy. There's a woman sitting in a theater box looking out over the auditorium, and there's a, her companion is gazing through his uh, opera glasses, seemingly not at the stage, probably more likely as a woman in a box on the other side of the theater. Um, but, um, but the subject was a very modern subject. These were absolutely up-to-the-date, fashionably dressed, a Parisian couple out for a night at the theater. And in, in terms of what was revered in the art of the past, this was just simply not acceptable. The kind of subjects that people expected to see chosen by artists were great scenes from the Bible, from history, uh, from mythological subjects, etc. So the Impressionists really were breaking new ground in the early, in the, throughout the 1870s, really. Um, this nude by Renoir on the left was shown at the second ex uh, Impressionist group exhibition in 1876. I just explain en passant that the Impressionists really were like a fringe group at the beginning. Most of them were not having all that much success at the annual salon. So they grouped together as, as a sort of informal exhibiting society and mounted their own ex exhibitions on a pretty low budget. So they were sort of outside of the official system. Um, this painting, The Nude in Sunlight, um, 1876, also in the Musée d'Orsay, caused a very uh, vitriolic reception in the critical press. Uh, the, c people couldn't, un what Renoir is obviously doing, and I think which is pretty clear to us, is he's playing with the effects of dappled sunlight over the figure of the nude woman. But uh, critics, one critic at the time said it looked like putrefying flesh. Um, <laughs> I show you on the right uh, a famous painting, the Valpin Saint Bather, by the great French artist of the earlier 19th century, Jean-Dominique Ingres, uh, painted in 1808, uh, just to give you a pretty strong contrast. And because Ingres sort of epitomized the qualities that were so admired in uh, academic painting, this absolutely seamless, smooth surface, very, very beautiful, clear, well-defined um, contour around the figure, beautiful de detailing of the uh, decoration and the fringe along the bottom of the bedspread, just to give you an idea of if that was the standard you were used to, why Impressionism seemed so crude and so shocking. But when the, um, as the Impressionists' careers progressed, and many of them lived a very long time, um, on the right here is a nude by Renoir from much, much later in his career, from about 1903, so it's you know, 30 years after the bather we last looked at. Um, they became tired with, of what they saw as the too sketchy, too fluid, too ephemeral quality of Impressionism. And they, they said, I think Cezanne, to quote from Cezanne, but many of them made similar remarks, that he wanted to make of Impressionism something solid and lasting, like the art of the museums. And so as they got older, they looked increasingly to old master prototypes. And I just show you this nude by Renoir here with a, at the lower left, uh, a Rembrandt, Susanna and the Elders, and in the middle, uh, a famous painting by Boucher in the Louvre that certainly all the Impressionists knew, uh, Diana at the Bath. Um, I think to see that he's, he's changed his technique, I mean, we wouldn't mistake the Renoir for an old master painting, but I think one can see quite clearly that he is trying, um, is aligning himself much more strongly with an old master tradition as an art, a mature artist at the end of his career. And we find the same thing with Degas. They also turn to these much more timeless classical subjects like the nude, whereas in their earlier work they had been concerned with 
subjects of contemporary, particularly contemporary Parisian life, such as scenes of boulevards or cafes, or fairly ordinary, um, unheroic landscape subjects. Degas, of course, is known above all as the painter of ballet dancers, but he, the nude is also one of his great subjects, particularly in his later career. Uh, this is a work he showed in the last of the uh, Impressionist group exhibitions in 1886 and when pastel was really becoming his principal medium and he had a, he was an incredible technician with pastel layering one layer over another and fixing each one so you get these very very rich coloristic effects in, in Degas and he himself said that at, in his later work he was looking very much to the example particularly of Titian and Venetian painters who used to get their very rich coloristic effects by layering one very thin transparent uh, glaze of oil paint over another. And Degas deliberately emulated this technique, but with rather different results in his work in pastel. Uh, copying was vital to all artists training in the 19th century, whether they were uh, traditional or avant-garde. And it was certainly true of the Impressionists. In fact, in many ways, it was more important for the Impressionists because they had less um, formal training than their academic counterparts. This is a woodblock print by the American artist Winslow Homer called Copying at the Louvre, 1874, which is exactly the year when Impressionism officially emerged. And we can see that the Grand, Grand Gallery, we have a, a large print blown up at the beginning of the exhibition too, uh, showing just how many of these uh, students, young artists, came to copy in the Louvre. Uh, the Louvre um, had opened in um, 1793, and it really was a revelation for people. Uh, and, and many other museums opened in, in Europe at the, in, in the early years of the 19th century, just ar around that time, uh, because art that previously had been confined to the palaces of kings and princes or very wealthy collectors suddenly became available to the general public. And this was an enormous sort of change in people's perception and knowledge and the availability of art to a very wide public. And when it first opened the Louvre uh, under the Napoleonic regime uh, and, and under the revolutionary 10-day week, five of those days were reserved entirely for copyists and the other five days for people just who were going to look. And as the 19th century progressed, the number of copyists became so huge that they had to limit the number because you just couldn't make your way through the galleries because of this great forest of easels. We have another, this painting in the exhibition by a rather strange artist called Paul Berrou, who I'd never heard of before starting to work on this show. And in fact, I came across this painting just as a comparative reproduction in the Metropolitan Museum's catalogue of the Manny Velasquez exhibition, showing a lady circa 1900 perched on her high stool and copying the work here above right, which at the time was one of the most popular paintings in the Louvre and one of the most copied. It's a um, Little Beggar Boy by Murillo. Uh, we weren't able to actually borrow this original painting for our exhibition here for the simple reason that you had it here in Atlanta only recently. It was in your first uh, Louvre exhibition. But we did find in the National Gallery in Stockholm a copy by uh, another Spanish artist of the 17th century. So we have a contemporary copy of that original painting. And we also have this beautiful little drawing on the left uh, which is by Cézanne, who's obviously uh, very intrigued by the pose of the seated boy. Uh, Cézanne was one of the artists who copied most extensively in the Louvre. One of his famous sayings is, the Louvre is the book in which we learn to read. And he was going back to the Louvre quite late in life when he was in his 50s and early 60s. It wasn't just as a young artist at the outset of his career. Cezanne had very little time for formal training in art schools. He said, institutions, stipends, and honors are made only for idiots, pranksters, and rogues. Let them go to the école. Let them have a raft of professors. I don't give a damn. 
So he um, copied, learned a great deal from copying in the Louvre. And in the Ecole du, des Beaux-Arts, which was the main art school and still is the main art school in Paris, a student would begin by copying from plaster casts, from sculptures. They had to become proficient at drawing through copying from sculpture before they were allowed to progress to the live model. And I think it's interesting to see Cezanne late in his career, this is one of his great still lives from 1895, again from the National Gallery in Stockholm, um, using a plaster cast, uh, there it is on the left, um, to, as the subject of his still life. Uh, we were very lucky to find an identical plaster cast to the one that Cezanne actually owned. The one that he owned uh, is now in the museum that they've made of his old studio in Aix-en-Provence in the south of France. It's after a French 17th century sculptor called Pierre Puget, who like Cézanne came from Provence and for whom Cézanne had great uh, admiration. But again, it so happened that we found Timothy Sandring and I on a rather dusty shelf in the basement of the National Gallery of Stockholm, this identical little cast. And I, as far as I know, it's the first time that we've been, that the, the cast has been shown together with the painting. And we've also been able to bring together some of these very beautiful uh, sketches that, that Cezanne did of this little figure. He was clearly fascinated by it. And I think, um, let's go back to the, painting for a minute, uh, if we ask ourselves what was it he was actually finding so interesting in this little sculpture. Well, as you probably know, there's a very powerful wind that sometimes blows through that part of France called the Mistral. And I suppose because Cézanne came from Provence and so did Puget, Cézanne once said what he loved about Puget's sculpture was that you sensed the Mistral blowing through it. And it is this great sense of dynamic movement and energy, which is very much, of course, a feature of 17th century Baroque art that I think has captivated Cézanne. And he's allowed it to energize the whole composition. I mean, for me, even though this is a, a still life, it, it's static objects, it absolutely breathes vitality and animation. I think we can see, too, that in his drawings, he's captured that movement of the figure with these repeated cursive lines, which is very much a hallmark of Cézanne's late style. And in fact, the drawings and the paintings seem to have more vigor than the sculpture which originally inspired this series of works. Um, Degas also really makes a point about the importance of copying in the Louvre, particularly for he, himself and his friends. This is the painting with which we open the exhibition because it really sums up the whole story so beautifully. It uh, painted in uh, about 1877, I think. It's um, Degas' great friend standing on the left, the American painter Mary Cassatt, who was born and uh, spent her early life in Philadelphia, but spent her whole uh, working and mature life in Paris. And she was one of the only two women artists in the Impressionist group, the other one being Bert Morisot. And she's seen here with her sister Lydia, who's sitting on a bench reading from a guidebook. Uh, one art historian has identified the painting they're looking at. I mean, it looks like Jackson Pollock, but I don't think it is. It's, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, they, it's been identified as a, a Veronese. Now, Degas really <laughs> learnt his skills as an artist by copying. He spent several years as a very young man traveling around in Italy, filling notebooks with uh, numerous beautiful drawings and studies of paintings that he, he looked at in, uh, ch in churches and museums in Rome, Florence, and many other, Assisi, many other places in Italy. But back in Paris, he continued copying. And here uh, at the upper left is his copy made in 1861 of Mantegna's crucifixion at the lower right of painting in the Louvre. Um, with many cases in this exhibition, it simply is not possible to borrow the works that the artists were copying in the Louvre. Often the works are enormous in scale and are works that really never leave the museum. The Mantegna actually is about the same size as the, uh, as the Degas copy, but it's a, it, it, Mantegna is an artist who's 
his work is not very extensive. It's, it's a key masterpiece of the Italian Renaissance in the Louvre's collection. So it would not be possible for it to travel. So in some cases, you'll find as you go through the exhibition, we have illustrated interesting comparisons like that on the label so that you do get a sense of the original that the artist was copying. Uh, here, I think we see that Degas not really interested in a very precise and accurate copy. He hasn't, he, it's not nearly as sharp and detailed as the original Mantegna. He's more interested in the overall design, the sort of choreographic groupings of the figures and the play of warm and cool colors throughout. And it's more loosely pa painted. Um, Degas once said himself, although nobody admired the old masters more than he did, he once said, the air in the paintings of the old masters is not the air that one can breathe. And so uh, in his own painting, I think there's a, a kind of a, a looseness and a more lively uh, modern feel in his copy. Um, I think one thing that's very interesting about the way the Impressionists used the art of the past and how they learned from it Apart from the actual direct copies, it, what's almost more fascinating is the way they absorbed these lessons very profoundly and the way that they emerged in a way that's not perhaps always immediately discernible. And you might be wondering why I'm showing this slide. It's of Degas' The Rehearsal of 1874. But when he was working on this painting, he was visited in his Paris studio by the great writer, critic, and journalist Edmond de Goncourt, said he found uh, Degas in his studio with his palette and his paintbrush standing on tiptoe trying to imitate the movements of the ballerinas. And Goncourt said, you know, well, tell me what you're doing in this painting. And Degas said, well, what I'm really trying to do here is to blend the tender softness of Velasquez and the silhouetted flatness of Mantegna. <laughs> now, that might not be immediately obvious, but I think if you think of the way that figures sort of meld so beautifully into the background in Velasquez's painting, who's such a rich uh, painter of such rich and painterly textures and surfaces, and then that very sharp linear definition that we just saw in the, in the crucifixion in the Mantegna, you get a sense of Degas always sort of hanging on to these two poles, these two principles, even in his absolutely contemporary subject pictures like this dance rehearsal. Um, as the Impressionists approached the uh, art of the past, they really did it through three principal routes, which were shaped by three major revivals that occurred around the middle of the 19th century in France. One was a great revival of interest in Spanish art of the 17th century, particularly Velasquez. The second was in Dutch art of the 17th century, especially the work of Franz Hals. And thirdly, in French 18th century art, the so-called Rococo period, with artists like Fragonard, Boucher, and Chardin. And these movements were extensively written about by prominent writers and critics. Uh, exhibitions of, their, of these periods were held in Paris. And so the Impressionists did have a lot of exposure to these particular periods. Manet, in particular, was fascinated by the art of 17th century Spain. He did go to Madrid, to the Prado in 1865, but he only stayed two weeks. But nevertheless, it seems to have had a very profound effect on him. The upper right, um, we have this. Um, I was very, very happy to get this particular grouping of works together because they, they tell such a nice, compact story. Um, at the upper right is the Va uh, Velasquez uh, Little Cavaliers. I think it's now just called a group of 13 people. Um, and on the left is Manet's very uh, close copy of the Velasquez. But I think you can see the difference in that it's a little bit more fluidly painted and the, the color is a bit more high keyed. Um, and he liked, Manet liked this work so much that he went on and made the engraving of it, the, the etching of it that we see below. Um, I'm showing you again a, a contemporary life subject by Manet of 1861, the same year that he made the copy of the Velasquez, because I think the kind of thing that's going on, if we look, try to look a little deeper and see what they were taking from the art of the past, if we go back to the, uh, the, the Velasquez and Manet's copy for a minute, you see it's a very... Um, 
in a way, a very unstructured composition. It's very informal for a 17th century painting. The figures are just sort of strung out across the landscape. And actually, Velasquez has included his own portrait at the far left with another artist, Murillo. And I think it's that kind of structure, that sort of informality, that in, that in which Manet saw something that he could pick up on in creating his own very modern subject of people in the Tuileries Gardens in 1861. And the figure at the extreme left with the beard and the top hat is Manet himself. And I think he's echoing that Velasquez self-portrait in the painting by Velasquez that he copied. And then very another, another nice sort of discovery and something I was very happy that we could get for this show is this lovely still life by Renoir, uh, which he includes um, the Manet etching after the Velasquez in the background. So it's very much a homage, I think, on Renoir's part, both to this vogue for Spanish 17th century art, and especially Velasquez, and also to Manet, whom all of the Impressionists admired very greatly. Here again we have uh, a painting that we wanted for this exhibition, but again you had it in your Louvre show, uh, fairly, the last Louvre exhibition, so you have all had a chance to see it. Uh, it's uh, now attributed to the school of Velasquez, although in the 19th century it was thought to be by Velasquez. Beautiful painting of the um, Infanta Margarita. And the story is, I don't know if it's true or not, that Degas and Manet actually met each other for the first time when they were making an etching of this very painting. And um, here we have uh, the two etchings by Degas and Manet after this subject. It was, what, again, like the Maria, it was one of the most popular paintings in the Louvre in the 19th century. Renoir has, is supposed to have said that all of painting was in the pink ribbons. And um, it, it has been suggested that this particular work by Velasquez influenced Renoir's famous painting of the theater box, which I showed you a few minutes ago. Um, as we were not able to have the Louvre painting again, because it's now gone on to the second venue of that Louvre show, which is the Denver Art Museum, we did borrow this, that I think is a spectacular work by Velasquez of the same sitter, the little daughter of the king, the Infanta Margarita. We borrowed this from the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna. And I do urge you that if you go to the exhibition, do take a careful look at this canvas because it's a spectacular piece of bravura painting by Velasquez. It's a fairly limited palette of this silvery gray with this beautiful rosy salmon pinks. It really doesn't show up um, in the slide, but he's sort of scattered over the, over the whole of the dress, which is so dramatically pulled right up to the front of the picture plane like this, filling the entire canvas. Uh, sort of, he spangled it almost with these random dabs and dashes, very freely painted, of a silvery paint. And then the handkerchief that she's holding in her hand is completely diaphanous, and the silver sort of glints through this uh, translucent white, very thinly painted white handkerchief. It's a spectacular painting, and I think it really sums up that brilliant bravura brushwork in Velasquez that the Impressionists so admired. Um, another work that's only just arrived in the show, it came a little bit late because it was in an exhibition of all the, well, many of the French 19th century works from the Metropolitan Museum in New York that has been lent to an exhibition in Berlin and had come just a couple of days late to our show, but it is here now. It's a wonderful, large, very impressive painting which is hung in the room devoted to Manet, so do take a good look at it. Um, I think, is it reversed, David? I'm afraid it's the wrong way around. Um, the figures should be on this side. Uh, it's very much a homage to Rubens. Um, Manet has portrayed himself with his fiancée, who was a Dutch woman called Suzanne Lehnhoff, and it's looking at a well-known landscape by Rubens in which he painted himself uh, with his wife. And although the landscape is very much recognizable as a sort of spot along the Seine, various elements like the rainbow are a tribute to Rubens. Here we have the painting the right way around. And I'm showing you here three engravings after 
um, a painting by Rubens, the one here with the rainbow, and two paintings by the it Italian artist Annibale Caracci that were published in a periodical, a very popular periodical in Paris at the time, called the Gazette des Beaux-Arts, which included um, many studies and lives of the old masters with engravings after their works. And it was a great source book of um, motifs and subjects for many artists. Because we have to remember that in the 19th century, um, people did not have access to all the wonderful uh, illustrated, colored illustrated art books, postcards, television programs, etc. that we have. The range of, of visual images, reproductions, was very much more limited. Although in the 19th century there was an enormous explosion, particularly in uh, prints. But of course these were black and white, so it would be very much motif and structure and composition that the Impressionists and other 19th century artists would be looking at rather than color and brushwork. Um, let's just show you this because of all the Impressionists, Monet was the one that really claimed to turn his back on the past, the old masters. He always said, oh, he never had time to go to the Louvre. He, in fact, did go once to register as a copyist, but instead of copying anything in the galleries, he painted this view, which is what you see if you look out of one of the windows of the Louvre. It's called the Garden of the Princess. But despite his... Um, assertion that he was not interested in the past. In fact, Monet was quite deeply grounded, particularly in Dutch 17th century landscape. I show you the beautiful picture here at the High Museum, the Monet uh, Seine at Argenté in autumn, and a painting uh, lower, uh, on the lower right by a Dutch 17th century landscape painter, Salomon van Rysdale. And I think you can immediately see the the sort of similarity of the river, the calm view, the trees along, growing along the river bank, and this high, wide sky, and the sensitivity to, to light and atmosphere. Of course, when you look at these two paintings in the gallery, you will also see that there are many differences. You know, Impressionist painting does not look like old master painting. The technique in the Impressionist picture is very different. Monet uses this small, broken brushwork that's typical of early Impressionism to capture light and atmosphere and create a, a feeling of spontaneity and immediacy, which is lacking in, in Dutch 17th century painting. It, it's a more, in a way more remote, calmer and more remote. But um, nevertheless, uh, Monet visited Holland on three occasions. He spent time in the Rijksmuseum, and I think he was very aware of these precedents. Um, Manet, again, looking at Dutch art here, a portrait of his, one of his favorite models, Victorine Meurant. She's actually the model, the nude model in the luncheon on the grass. And a painting we borrowed from a small uh, provincial museum in England by Franz Hals. And I think these are very nice comparison for that sort of modesty of the subject. There's a very modest quality about Dutch 17th century painting and also the creamy texture of the paintwork. Um, Dutch 17th century, again, very much lies behind uh, fabulous man is still life, one of the great still life of the 19th century, in my opinion, that we've borrowed from the museum in Shelburne, Vermont, and um, a piece by Van Clays here, a major Dutch 17th century uh, still life painter, and I think you can see the comparisons very clearly. Uh, David Brenneman told me that he was talking to someone in the galleries who was quite knowledgeable about art and actually thought the man was a Dutch 17th century painting, and I think you can see why. Um, a, a different a, a tradition in old master still life painting, that of the so-called game piece, the dead bird, on the left one by Chardin, and on the right by the uh, Impressionist painter Basile, who died, uh, who was killed very young. He was killed in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. And on the uh, left is a painting we wanted to get for the exhibition, but we were not able to borrow it from the Musée d'Orsay of Renoir actually uh, painting Basile, painting this very still life. Two di rather different kinds of still life here. Uh, one by uh, an artist called Mon Monnoyer on the left, who was a a 17th century French artist actually, and a master of these great decorative, rather formal still life pieces, which is being very much uh, picked up on again by Basile in this unusually, for an impressionist artist, formal, very beautiful and opulent still life, I think very much paying homage to the uh, 17th and 18th century still life tradition. 
uh, a beautiful Renoir upper left, it's painted with that wonderful translucency, it, it peaches and a blue and white bow. It's interesting, I think, when we remember that Renoir actually began his life as a painter on porcelain, and a lovely little chardin of a basket of pears uh, or plums, um, showing this, um, the way that I think, and Renoir was very, very interested in the 18th century, and here he is, I think, capturing that spirit of intimacy that is so much uh, part of Chardin's genius. Another 18th century comparison here. This is one of my favorite works in the show, The Fragonard Girl Reading, 18th century painting that we've borrowed from the National Gallery in Washington. Do take a close look at this one. The textures and the brushworks are absolutely fantastic in this. And Mary Cassatt's painting of a friend of hers reading on the left is picking up on this uh, 18th century subject matter, women reading or sewing or quietly absorbed in these sort of private tasks was a very popular subject, both in Dutch 17th and, and 18th century French painting. But if anything, the, the, the cassette, the Impressionist painting, I think is more tightly painted than the older picture here. Uh, again, Renoir uh, looking at the 18th century and the tradition of the so-called fête champêtre, which is people picnicking, playing music, rather courtly people in an, in an idealized uh, landscape setting. Uh, Renoir painted a few paintings around this theme with a couple uh, in, in, in a landscape setting, the woman very often dressed in white. I show you a painting by Watteau, one of the great French artists of the 18th century, called The Perfect Accord on the left. We have other splendid examples. We have a little, beautiful little Watteau in the show and a painting in this fête champêtre mode by an artist called Oué. Uh, here is, is uh, Bert Morisot, the other woman artist in the Impressionist group other than Cassatt. And here she is, uh, here's a copy by Morisot, very, very free, frothy, loosely painted copy of a detail. You can just see the two figures on the cloud in the middle of the uh, painting by Boucher on the left. This is another one of those cases where the Boucher painting in the Louvre is enormous, but we were lucky to find a small version of it by Boucher in the Clark Art Institute in Williamstown. Uh, but Morisot um, always, I think she learned from the 18th century and she always painted in this very light, uh, loose technique, very, very spontaneous bravura way of painting, which you'll see there's a, a painting in the, in the exhibition of two young girls sitting in a garden which she, in which she retains this technique. But she was quite mature. She was a woman in her 40s when she did this large scale copy. It wasn't just the student learning exercise. And I think she attached a lot of value to it because she always had it hanging over the fireplace in her home. Uh, this is a Fragonard, not in the show, but I show it to you as an example of this bravura painting. What's fascinating about this picture, it's in the Louvre, and it's in, in, on writing on the back it says, painted in one hour. Uh, <laughs> whether this is actually true or not, but I just showed it to you, but, but I think our beautiful painting from Washington of the girl reading actually serves the purpose just as well, but this very spontaneous a technique of Fragonard that the Impressionists loved and sort of adapted to their own ends so successfully. And here's Bert Morisot again, and I think you can see she's sort of reinventing this Fragonard-like technique. And in fact, critics often commented at the time on the, on the similarity, the way that, that Morisot was a sort of updated version of artists like Fragonard. Um, then we have uh, Chardin again, and in, in the last uh, gallery of the exhibition devoted to so-called genre painting, meaning scenes of everyday domestic life, marvelous early uh, painting by Pissarro on the left of a servant girl, just before he develops his full impressionist technique, was actually based on a photograph. But I think you can see that sort of tradition of, of giving a lot of weight and dignity and solidity to these uh, figures engaged in domestic work is something that's coming up very much in the 19th century artists as well. And then um, tremendously opulent still lives also had quite an impact. This is a, a, a famous um, painting in the Louvre by the Dutch 17th century artist Jan David de Heim. 
um, called the banquet still life or the dessert. And this um, had a lot of uh, impact, rather like um, you know, the Titian Fetch on Petra was one of those uh, paintings that had a lot of revenant, uh, resonance for later artists. It was picked up by Cezanne in his late work and these incredibly rich, uh, opulent still lives. You can see that Cezanne's composition is not nearly so stable. He's playing with the perspective of the color, but he's very much inspired by uh, still life like the Deheim. And then if we go a little bit further, this is from the 1890s, then when we get to 1915, we find Matisse looking at the same painting, um, but uh, structuring it in a very different sort of way. And no doubt Matisse is looking back through Cézanne uh, to De Heim. So I think what I hope will emerge from this exhibition is that really how all art is a continuum. I think as the famous uh, art historian Ernst Gombrich once said, nothing came from nothing. And they're always learning from the, art, uh, from the art of the past. But in the hands of great and original artists, uh, like the Impressionists or like Matisse, it gets reinvented and used in a very profound and interesting way. And I think I should point out just so uh, to clarify that in the exhibition that we have included a number of works that are direct copies, but also we've put together works that we hope will be provocative and illuminating comparisons, but they may not always be what the older works, that is, that the Impressionists actually knew. We weren't intent on trying to find deliberate sources involved in a sort of source spotting game, but the older artists are meant to be sort of prototypes uh, to stand for a school, a type of painting, which we know from plenty of evidence that the Impressionists were passionately interested in, and to show you how they sort of reinvented and used those older models uh, with great originality. And I'd just like to end by showing how I think this, what we might think of as creative reinvention goes on well into our own time. Um, this is a famous painting, um, Pontormo's Visitation of 1528 from a, a church of San Michele Carmignano in Florence. And then we find the great contemporary video artist, Bill Viola, uh, using this as the subject of one of his uh, videos, which is called After Pontormo's Visitation of 1995, which was shown at the Venice Biennale this year. So I think this learning from the art of the past is reinventing uh, and leading on to great works of art that are totally original, but still drawing on the richness of the past is by no means confined to Impressionism. It's been true of the history of art uh, from the beginning until our own time. Thank you. <laughs>